So, so uh, welcome everyone to our third virtual stay at home event with Writing Beyond. And uh, we uh, welcome these opportunities for us to reconnect with horses and how we can assist one another in attending to so many of the uh, this, so many issues around this strange time we're living in with the uh, pandemic. And, and so uh, I, I'm just personally really grateful for your presence and, and those of you who will be listening to this recording. And uh, as we explore what horses can offer us during this time. And especially today, we're going to be looking at uh, issues of the systemic racism that's come to the fore in our country. And so I want to thank initially, first of all, uh, Denise, uh, who's uh, our maven on the technical side of things. Yeah, thank you, Denise. And Jen, who's going to be sharing with us some of her wisdom. Uh, later. Oh, and Karen is our volunteer <laughs> coordinator. She'll be contributing a few things too. And uh, Peggy, Peggy Dean is in there. Mm -hmm. And so thank you all for the parts that you have been contributing to these each time. So um, <clears throat> we're going to start with uh, just getting a little bit of uh, sharing about where we're at right now. And so Denise has a couple of polls for us. The first one is for us to just get a feel for, uh, you know, which of the elements that you feel the most akin to lately? Is it earth, air, fire, and water? Just select one of those, one element that you feel the most akin to lately. And uh, check it off there. And, um, and we'll see where we're all feeling most akin to lately. Okay, so the eight percent of every um, of, of participants today feel like they're akin to Earth. Air is thirty eight percent as well. And fire and water are both at 13%. Isn't that interesting? I, I, I almost, personally, I almost checked air because I have just been reveling in the quality of the air since um, there's so much less pollution. Um, does anyone else have any quick reflection on what their choice was? That's fine. Let's go ahead now. Um, uh, Andrea? I just completed 10 days of sending out, mailing out um, poems about water for 10 days. So that definitely got me into what I feel now is a more fluid, some of the projects I'm working on, I just want it more fluid, staying in the flow of what's going on, so. Yeah. Yes. Very well. Same for you. Yeah. Yeah. I I really wanted to check fire because I'm in the week of fire and the poetry call this this month. But somehow I just sort of tuned in and I realized it's air. I feel like I'm in the air these days. I don't feel as grounded as I usually do. Um, I don't feel tremendously fiery, and the the quality of there is wonderful, and I almost feel like I'm more in contact with the the beingness of the air. I I know I can't say that in a way that it makes sense, but anyway, that's why I checked air. Also, I'm an air sign. <laughs> the beingness of the air. I love that. That's, I checked air, the wind through the trees, you know, making its presence known in visible ways frequently. Uh, and I'm more aware of my breath lately as well. 
Hmm. It wouldn't let me vote because I launched the poll, but I would have chosen Earth. Um, Mm. And I have to, because I'm an earth sign, I'm a Taurus, but also i am uh, been really involved with the earth lately, with the garden and the pasture and all that. And I just am feeling very much a part of the earth and feeling that, um, you know, that stability and peace that comes with that. <clears throat> Sweet. So let's look at the uh, time zone that we're all here from. I think I'm pretty sure, but let's go ahead and look at that poll. I know some of the people who signed up were from other time zones, but they're not here yet. So um, I'm pretty sure. It's going to be a hundred percent Pacific, but we'll see. <laughs> Everybody had voted. <laughs> Hi, Angelis. Mm. Hi. <laughs> I'm working. It's a working again. Oh, one. Okay, so we're all from the Pacific time zone. Um, we'll see if some of the other. I know at least two people had registered from uh, the East Coast or at least uh, Eastern time. And so we'll see if they, if they make it here. So um, let's, uh, so let's go ahead and get ourselves anchored with um, the four direction or the seven directions, sorry. Uh, Peggy, will you lead us in that? hear you. I unmuted myself, but I'm muted again. <laughs> yeah, there we are. You're good. I'm good. Spirit of the East, of the yellow horses, the season of spring and place of sunrise, we call you to bring your inspiration and creativity to our new beginnings. Thank you for your illumination. Spirit of the South of the Red Horses, the season of summer in place of growth and harvest, please bring your energy and strength to our gathering. Thank you for your warmth and connection. Spirit of the West of the Black Horses, season of fall in place of preparation, please bring your powers of introspection and exploration to our gathering. Thank you for your insight. Spirit of the North of the White Horses, season of winter and place of purification, please bring your powers of renewal to our gathering. Thank you for your patience. Spirit above of the Mythical Horses, place of spiritual influence and vast beyond, please shine your light on this gathering. Thank you for your compassion and love. Spirit below of the horses we see and touch, may our connection with them root and ground us in our work and in our learning. Thank you for purpose. Spirit of the center, we honor our center as we bring our open hearts to the center of this gathering and the practice of deep listening. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you for that harvesting of a, the, the larger context within which we gather today and move into our exploration. So, so at Writing Beyond, many of our activities uh, with our 
participants with our horses involve interactions based on what the horses can offer us and also what we can offer back to them. Uh, uh, we have a, a video of a herd, I think it's from somewhere in Europe, that we're going to watch here. Uh, as, as I explain a bit about what we've harvested at Riding Beyond. So go ahead, Denise, and, and start that playing. And um, notice, if you will, uh, as I'm speaking, some of the interactions that they offer us. <laughs> notice the details of their movement about uh, what they notice around them and their interactions with one another. So, uh, the, the, uh, s some of the elements, the t horse's talents that we have uh, particularly attended to with Riding Beyond have to do with the herd dynamics, which you're able to see a bit here in this video, and, the, and what we can learn about the power of community and what it means to be a leader. Um, and, and another one is uh, their, their discomfort with incongruence, meaning that we may be feeling one way, but maybe sort of preoccupied with our thoughts and, and not really fully in our bodies, maybe pretending to feel one way and, and inside feeling something different. That makes horses really uncomfortable. And so we can learn with them about, you know, staying centered and becoming truth telling to ourselves and others and having uh, operating out of a congruence. So, and, and another one, another talent they have is uh, providing archetypal companionship, if you will, through the power and beauty that they've offered us uh, throughout human history. That they, they give us, the, uh, because they're associated in our imaginations with uh, heroic uh, deeds, they, they allow us to access our larger selves and then there is their large heartedness, um, which has been uh, so, uh, uh, I'm so grateful for the documentation of the way their large heartedness has uh, affected and healed so many veterans to allow their coherent heart rhythm to um, really offer those veterans a, a coherent heart rhythm that they've lost through the PTSD that they um, suffer from. And, um, and then there is their heightened sensing of the em environment that they feel through their skin, through their, no their ears, uh, like tele you know, antenna, their eyes, their large eye, their, their extreme sensitivity to what's going on around them. And, um, and, and allowing us to attune to our own uh, ability to feel the energetics and in, in the environment and interpersonally in our, in, in our communication with one another. And, so, and then there is uh, their talent for returning to calm following uh, some alarm. Now, uh, these horses here are clearly in that state of calm and sort of a, a curiosity. And uh, horses have, have a great ability to, you know, take take to the hoof and run, but then they're within a few minutes um, back to calmly grazing. Uh, and teaching us at the qualities of emotional resilience and being able to modulate our own energy when we need to. And then finally, there is their nonverbal uh, non body language, um, which we often are so reliant on our ability to communicate verbally that we have lost touch with how we might express ourselves more fully with our whole head, our whole heart, our whole gut. And, um, and they help us to learn to uh, avoid this reliance on the spoken word and to increase our literacy with our body language and learning the language of feel in particular that we're gonna explore today. So at our first um, stay at home event, uh, we uh, explored, okay, that's it. We can turn that off there. Thank you, Denise. In our first stay at home event here, we explored heart breathing or coherent breathing. 
which is a riding beyond practice that we engage to connect uh, to ourselves, the horses, and the larger world with an emphasis on interaction from the heart center. Uh, Linda Kohanath had written eloquently about her experience with COVID-19 on Facebook and uh, how this really helped her get through uh, some of the anxiety of not being able to breathe, just the threat of, to her well-being. And so we practiced heart breathing and we imaginally traveled quickly through, um, throughout the 40,000 year history of the horse-human relationship. And then in our last session, we explored how our interactions with horses can offer us a radical resilience during uh, these unusual times of the global pandemic. That has to do with that heightened sensing of our environment, uh, how, uh, tuning interpersonally to uh, others and to um, the, in our own environment, what's going on, and then how to return to calm when we need to. And so uh, we, we concluded that session with a, a crowdsourced poem and um, that, was, that was contributed by each of the participants. And, uh, and, and that was enhanced by uh, items from the natural world that people had brought to their session, the session and uh, created a, um, uh, an image that we enhanced that with. So um, Denise, if you'll show that image of the poem and the art, and just for a moment, just listen to uh, what we came up with, even if you can't read it there, uh, because I think this poem actually has uh, a lot more relevance than we might have anticipated for what's uh, unfolded in the, these last few weeks with the intensity of what's uh, emerged with the Black Lives Matter um, movement. So let's just listen to this poem that we sourced last week. The title of the poem is, If the Horses Can Keep Dancing, So Can I. What I'm learning about resilience. Just now, just today, breathe. Inside the rose, the present moment unfolds. Just now, just today, breathe. Standing still with a heart breath is my first step. Just now, just today, breathe. I am a crystal receiving and sending energy to the larger world. Just now, just today, breathe. Resilience ebbs and flows in nature, in life. Just now, just today, breathe. From nature comes my patience and peace. Just now, just today, breathe. A sense of flowing energy is always available to me as is the flow of my breathing in and out, breathing me. There is a center point in the bouncing between what was and what will be that is accessed most easily through the breath. Stay connected to the present moment as often as you can. Resilience has always been embracing me whether I knew it or not. Great muscular arms hold me, strong as the haunches of a horse ready to dance. An equine sense of being beneath my feet. Soothing, nourishing, exploring keeps me calm and energized, safe in the herd steady as I go. There is seeing through the field. We were all pretty amazed at what we created that day. So today uh, we're taking as our context some more heartbreaking recent events really around the world with the Black Lives Matter um, movement and it's how it has really revealed us the systemic racism that's prevalent in our world and in particular the prevalence of a culture of violence in in police interactions and we're going to explore some of the implications of it attending to the non-verbal body language that horses are so skilled with in connection with these these concerning these concerns um, recently, my friend 
Carol Dixon, uh, who is steeped in the Southern Georgia culture where she grew up and lived most of her adult life until moving here to Oregon three years ago. She wrote a, a poem, a few words about this. Here's what she wrote. I woke up before my alarm went off is the story of my life. I woke up to racism, to energy work. The alarm is now going off, but I already woke up. It's, it is still devastating for the alarm to ring. For that which we slumbered around now has awoken. A slumbering beast of societal injustice, environmental degradation. There is no sleep now, but then how do we redefine a dream we, if, we are, if we are awake? Lucid dreaming, perhaps. Now is the time to direct the dreamers to better dreams, to awaken ourselves to our privilege. How do we reconcile our lives with this alarm? We must do the work. And it is to sit with ourselves and our privilege and figure out how to share it. I woke up before the alarm, but did I use the time well? It's really good to hear her read that in her Georgia drawl, but I think it speaks for all of us. So um, we at Writing Beyond have published a statement of our solidarity with peoples around the world gathering peacefully to express our intentions to uh, attend to these matters, right? But right now we have been called to a new awareness. Uh, appropriate action from that awareness is really in its infancy. Addressing how to change the system that supports inequality and does, does not promote equality. How do we do that? We find that listening is, our, is the first best thing to do. And uh, we're going to deepen our practice in that skill today from the perspective of what courses offer us. In the future, we intend uh, as an organization to seek and invite co-creation, involvement, and contribution from those experiencing inequality to move things toward the systemic change that we seek. So Peggy Dean, um, she's one of our board members of Riding Beyond and a longtime horse person, lifetime horse person, really. Uh, she's a master coach and trainer at Coach Academy. She recently pointed out to me that the processes that they teach coaches for working with their clients involve these uh, four steps. The first is listening. Second is ask questions. The third is acknowledge. And then the fourth is to suggest collaboration. So Peggy, would you uh, just would you share a few more words with us about that? Yes, I'll be glad to do that. And whether, whether it's relationship with a horse or with a human being, that first step of deeply listening, and that means non-verbally as well as verbally, but it starts with listening, being willing to listen. And then a bridge of connection begins. Uh, and then we start to trust in the authenticity and the intention of the other even though we may disagree with what they're saying. And then curiosity and interest in knowing the other begins to form. So then we have questions, questions to understand, to clarify, and the bridge becomes stronger. So then we have the urge to acknowledge the experience of connection that we're beginning to experience with that horse or with that person. And then collaboration and partnership uh, may emerge, you know, for further exploration, for finding common ground. But it starts with that deeply listening to begin the connection. Mm. Thank you, Thank you. So, um, right away when Peggy was sharing those, those steps with me, a few weeks ago, I noticed that they really described the core of our interactions with horses at Riding Beyond, that, that 
it's this very process that we teach our at our volunteer training uh, and much of what we share with our participants participants involves learning to listen to the nonverbal language of the horse not not just with our ears but um, with our whole bodies you know what do we feel with our skin our emotional selves our intuitive selves um, engaging our entire nervous systems head heart and gut um, it's important that we learn to integrate those kinds of medicine messages because they sometimes they're in conflict with one another you know what our head tells us doesn't seem in sync with what we hear from our heart and uh it, it it's a really valuable process that we learn to practice our deepest wisdom in these interactions with others and with problem problem solving issues that confront us uh, by learning to integrate what we uh, understand from the head heart and gut um, and horses, uh, they really notice if we're just operating out of our head or too much in our heart, they, they really appreciate it. They feel, they'll just walk over to you and they'll walk away if you, once we get off balance. We've had that happen over, over and over again. Um, they, they, they tune into that and they appreciate it when we're uh, in tune with ourselves. And so, um, um, like Peggy was saying that we, um, she, you know, she was outlining that listening and then acknowledging and, um, you know, at just noticing, you know, I've, I've recently moved my horses, um, over, uh, to another place where they live in a couple of acres pasture with two little miniature horses and one of these little minis who is actually the mother of the other one um, she's extremely shy she comes from a background of abusive neglect and uh, when she arrived with her current owner six years ago uh, she she wouldn't come near anybody she just stayed as far away in the pasture as she could and uh, she's still extremely shy and um, and uh, Kathy, who lives there, you know, warned me that she probably wouldn't come around. Okay, so um, that bridge that people that Peggy was speaking about, um, that bridge of connection, uh, uh, I started noticing with Minnie, that's her name, that even from a distance, she would look up and her ears would come forward. She'd be uh, curious, but very much at a distance and it's been uh, uh, so it was, it's been really a fascinating uh, sweet journey the last few weeks to uh, notice when she's curious and inviting interaction and I'll just maybe walk a little bit closer to her and she she's even a uh, an, uh, even in those early days she would take a few steps towards me but then she'd, she'd look away. And so I would immediately uh, uh, respect that, that communication and, and step back or pause. It's just been wonderful so that the last few days, like yesterday when I went out, uh, she and her daughter, who's called Ruffian, um, they both immediately came over to the fence uh, together. And, and to me, that was just a huge, piece of progress and Kathy confirmed it was too that uh, in that um, Minnie and Ruffian both were eagerly uh, taking some uh, pieces little bits of uh, grass from my hand which she would never have done a few weeks ago a uh, Minnie wouldn't have now Ruffian she was all for it and so it's just been it's been a wonderful process of uh, of listening to many communications and acknowledging that and then you know asking uh you know asking questions like you know can i do this with you or what are you inviting me to do um and then uh just making little suggestions about how we might create a bridge between one another it's been very sweet um i have uh, 
I, I noticed at one point I had put a, a grooming bucket out in the middle of the field while I was grooming my own horses. And I stepped away from it because the horses were loose and they had drifted off. And so I stepped away from the grooming bucket. And right away, uh, both Ruffian and Minnie uh, indulged their curiosity about this grooming bucket. And they, uh, I looked back and here they were both sniffing at it. And I was, I was saying to him, now don't you be picking those up and carrying them off, you know? And, and uh, they, uh, so all of a sudden I noticed that Minnie, the one who's the most shy, she was standing there and rocking back and forth over the bucket. And I couldn't quite figure out what she was doing at first, but uh, I realized that the, um, the file that I sometimes use on uh, their hooves was sticking straight up and that she had discovered that if she placed herself over that, she could get a nice belly scratch. And she continued with that for a good five minutes. And I realized that someday I'm going to be able, I'm going to be able to, show her how uh, she can enjoy uh, that touch from a human like you know mystic and journey do so much and uh, someday i'm hoping to be able to show her uh, that she can really uh, you know step into that that um, delight of you know t that kind of touch so, you know, it, it's really uh, something that that kind of process of uh, just being appreciative of w some little step and how that can um, can translate into our interactions with others, uh, our family members, our other people. I've just deeply appreciated it. Now, so Jen has, has been, uh, she spent many years in the practice of feel, which she brings this, her talent for this work and uh, her love of it really to the work we do at Writing Beyond. And she's been, she's been at Writing Beyond from the very first inklings. Um, and uh, she's really enabled uh, the power of the work that we do with Mystic and Abby Aww. Journey. And so uh, Jen, would you, I, I've asked her to share some of her learnings because she's got lots of great stories. So would you share some of that with us? Now, Jim. Yeah, I'd love to. Can you guys hear me? Am I unmuted? Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you, Trish. That was really sweet. Um, I do feel like I've gone on a big journey with Riding Beyond. And so when we were um, at the board meeting and talking about what this um, topic of um, social injustice and racism, um, how we might speak to that, I immediately thought about what the horses would do or what they do and um, what they had to teach us about that. Um, the first thing that came to mind is that they're not big judges, right? They don't spend a lot of energy um, looking at us and seeing what car we drive up in or um, what our hair looks like or the color of our skin even um, if we're wearing new boots. But what they're really interested in is what we've been talking about, how we're feeling on the inside. Um, actually, when they do that, they um, are looking to try to figure out everything in their environment and how to keep themselves safe. So if we're feeling incongruent, like you have been talking about, or if we're feeling um, like the situation is heightened in some way, if we're holding tension or pressure, they're gonna read that and try to figure out how that relates to their own safety. Um, they're a master at reading energy. And so um, what I, I love about that is that when I really tune in myself and I use my whole body as a tuner, I can really start to listen with an attending that's different than I might only be listening to with my ears. Um, I find that I'm able to hear them and be able to communicate with them best when I'm relaxed, soft, open. And that awareness brings me right into the present moment where they're most curious to be. Um, I also realize that this is a body state that if I, I practice with the horses, it would be a body, an embodiment that I could take with me into newer novel situations. Um, if I can imagine or remember times, yeah, I needed that. Breathing with my horse in a new situation or a place where I feel unsure or maybe even unsafe, that helps ground me and gives me um, an opportunity to maybe respond and to really notice the environment rather than just be triggered and react like 
when I get on a social media thing or when my computer doesn't do what it wants, I tend to get really triggered. So Peggy Dean asked me to remember the horses and do a little horse breath. I encourage all of us to do any of those, any of one of those, any time of day, because it really does relax my own body and tuner. It takes the pressure off. Um, and it's a practice. It's a skill. It's like a muscle. And so when we started thinking, I started thinking about that, I thought, well, what's the muscle that really uses this kind of skill? And it, for me, it's feel. Um, there's all different kinds of feel. Like um, I feel what a uh, glass of cold beverage feels in my hand or going when I swallow it and um, a hot day or the warmth of someone's touch on my skin. Or um, it could be an emotion like, oh, I'm really mad. I can't believe I missed that. Or um, I'm really happy. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be able to do that thing. Um, so even though sensing and emotions are definitely part of what we do and the kind of feel, the kind of feel I'm trying to explain, and because the horses are such masters at getting subtler and subtler and subtler at it, is I, I could explain it a hundred times, a hundred different ways over and over again and always come out different. It's relational feel. Um, for me, that means creating a space first attending my own body and then creating a space between me sorry uh, I'm in the wind um, a little air for me um, creating that space that allows me to um, have a connection um, a, a subtle common body connection between me and the thing I'm relating to um, so um, one of the things that I started to really understand is I, I said yes to mystic here's my stories about mystic uh, as a horse handler and immediately i said oh uh this is going to be really interesting um those of you who know mystic she's not a 29 year old been there done that just laid back quarter horse she's an arab mare part and she has a lot of opinions um it's one of the great things about what gives her such uh, wonderful feedback and ability to be transformative to um, participants and volunteers as we do the riding beyond process. But I found myself holding on to the end of the rope. I personally, personally am not a directive or uh, dominant type of leader. Um, I tend to be an allower. And so I kind of got to the end of the rope and I put a loop in it like a feel or a belly in your rope which just means choking up on the edge of her halter and trying to tell her what to do wasn't going to be um, a suitable leadership style for me uh, so I just concentrated on connecting to mystic connecting to mystic and I just she was what I attended I didn't I mean I was aware that there was other things going on around me but I was truly attending her, open to her. What's she looking at now? How's she feeling now? How's this going? How can we do this? Are we, can, can we come to a stop now? And I, I was probably really vigilant in the beginning, but as time went on, I really started to feel like what Peggy said, that the trust that started to develop when she noticed, I was noticing everything that she was noticing. And I was developing a way that I was really um, strongly and deeply listening to her um, as my um, attending focus. Um, and when that started to happen, she started to relax. I started to relax. Participants started to relax. And it became obvious that we were going in the right direction and that we were going together. And it was really important that I figure out how to stay connected to her. And for me, the way in was feel and feeling of her and how I could be an open channel to uh, receiving and feeling what she was feeling and then give back. So then as it went on, um, we, I decided and we thought about having some sort of common language that um, I, I figured I might have something to share with other people who wanted to be horse handling. Um, and we wanted to have some sort of common language to be able to express the mystic that we're all on the same page and we wanted to continue to allow her to express herself yet still stay very safe. And so um, one of the first things um, I tried to put into words was haltering. I think it was the seven steps of sacred haltering. Uh, lo and behold, the first couple steps are, uh, have nothing to do with the halter. They had everything to do with how I centered and attuned myself and prepared myself to be with my horse. And that's one of the things that being with horses teaches me, how to be truly my best human self, the 
the most open, the most soft, the most relaxed. And the more I do it, the subtler and subtler my ability to communicate with her and, and, and her back to me becomes. And that's the part I get excited about. That's the part that I want to talk about. So um, I'll just run you through what I do in a haltering process. It's not like the seven steps, but um, we tend to be human doers. I'm a classic doer. I've just always got something to do. And um, it has momentum. Um, and we, we turn on. I get up in the morning, I have my coffee, and I'm out, ready to go. And so um, when I get ready to get near my horse, if I'm really conscious, I can do it on my way out my door. My horse lives in a barn behind me. Um, but most of the time, it's almost not until I see the head over the stall. And I'm like, oh, this is usually boogie is the first one I see. And I start to immediate relax, immediately relax. And I find that if I start attending my doing by just attending being, what we do together has better timing, less pressure, and is just more deeply connected. And I can sense when the right things are. So I might touch him first, a little pony knuckle, let him come to me, say hello. Um, I might decide I'll pick up the halter. I open the door because, you know, that's the thing we want to do. We want to get closer to one another. Pressuring Boogie by standing uh, uh, face to face with him is a lot of energy and so typically I turn to the side and I wait for him to approach over the top of my shoulder so it's a tracking process I'm doing I'm tracking well how's he feeling how's I'm how am I feeling what's the next step and because I'm tracking um, consciously these details our timing is usually pretty good and pretty soft and I'm not thinking I got to get the rope around his neck I'm thinking there you are how are you doing? And I'm open to him opening to me. And when he's, when I open that channel first, what's possible between us becomes a really amazing process. Um, and I usually find that in doing so, I'm training my body. He's training me to train my body to be receptive for deep connection. And I think that's what's gonna help me become a better human. So um, in the mornings, I might find I'm thinking something instead of just really being open to when I should put the halter around it. So I can check myself and say, wow, I, I was just thinking. And even thinking is a bit of pressure for sensitive horses. So then I can stop my thinking and then he might turn, put his head lower and I think, now's the right time, now's the right time. And I go ahead and I put on the halter and then the next step is, are we ready to go? And we start the whole tracking process over again so that when we do take a step forward, hopefully it's together. And as I stay connected and together with my horse, I increase safety. And as safety increases, increases our willingness to um, share trust, be open, increases. So it's kind of circular. All right, so that's my story about uh, me and Mystic and also about the process I do for tracking and altering. So the next thing I'd like to do is, um, I think we were all instructed to bring a little morsel. That's good, because I'm kind of dry. It's gotten a little hot out here and I'm um, ready to do some sort of sensing. Um, so the activity is about pausing and becoming fully aware it's the art of um, attending being. Um, so what I'm gonna ask us to do is um, something that we do all the time, which is pick up a morsel and eat something. But what, I'm, what I hope that we do is that we're going to do it with some uh, pause and stillness built in. So at some point in your um, chewing and enjoying, just surprise yourself and decide to stop. And when you stop, you're going to stop that um, habitual um, energy that we use either consciously or unconsciously for doing things. And then I want us to just be with that and see what we can collect from our body. Maybe you'll notice um, a sensation, how you feel, and start using the tracking process that I use for haltering in relationship to your own body. So you might um, discover a sense that you hadn't heard before, something that you hear, something that you feel, uh, an image might come up. So whatever it is, I'm going to ask it. And when we do the pausing, it's not a wait with a holding of the breath. 
it's really releasing into stillness to collect that right timing for the next step. Get your message. If you have to chew, because I've practiced this a couple of times, and sometimes I'm chewing and I stop and I get something and all of a sudden I don't know it, but I'm chewing again. And that's okay. You can do it a couple of times. Chew, stop, chew, stop. And then um, once we get done, I'll ask anybody if they want to uh, share or harvest a little something from their experience. So maybe the first step we need to do is maybe shake our hands, get a little loose, feel our feet on the floor, <sighs> take a deep breath. You guys, anybody that can do horse breath can do one. <sighs> I'm pretty good at that. All right, you guys all have your stuff. Everybody ready? All right, enjoy the process of attending a regular thing and break the habitual pattern. All right, here we go. Everybody keep breathing. I tend to think and then I stop breathing. So keep breathing. Try it again if you want. <laughs> okay, I hope everybody enjoyed that like I did. I had blueberries that had been warm warming in the sun and when I put them in my mouth, they were mm, texturally different because they, I'm not used to having my blueberries be in the sun. So it was a um, really warm experience. And the feeling that I gleaned by the process of learning how to feel into my body, check what I'm doing, feel into my body, check what I'm doing, was happiness. And I didn't know it was there. And it was really excited happiness that was so genuine and so deeply delicious that... Um, I don't know how else I would have gathered that. So thanks for letting me share. Is there anybody else that would like to share their process of uh, attending a non-doing? Well, I'll say um, I, I took a bite of chocolate. Ooh, nice. My favorite foods. And I noticed how on different parts of my tongue, it tasted quite different. It was actually bitter on the sides of my tongue. In the middle, it was more sweet. Uh, I, I just noticed this whole palette of flavors that I really hadn't noticed before. That, you know, that, um, that kind of reminds me. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, that they reminds come, you. <laughs> yeah. They come together to what I love as chocolate, one of my favorite foods. Go ahead. Not that reminds me of what we talked about last week about how when we really slow down and tune in, we can find something that helps change our perspective or opens us to a greater um, ability to be aware because we've done that slowing in and checking, checking with ourselves in a way that habitual motion and just constant doing doesn't allow. So thanks exactly. for sharing your bittersweet, loving perspective. <laughs> I love chocolate too. I think if I could give you some blueberries, you could give me some chocolate. Now we'd be on to something. Oh, that would be really good together. I know. Anybody else? Be brave. Tell me how your chewing went. I'll share. Um, mine was kind of similar to Trish. And that I had chocolate as well. It was actually a, a dark chocolate truffle. And I took a bite and immediately I noticed there's different textures because the outside is a little more you know firm and then I stopped and just kind of let it sit there and um it was hard <laughs> you know my mouth keeps wanting to work it and and I'm salivating and um but it it's made me slow down and just really enjoy it you know just um really savor it and you know, and, and as Trish said too, I could taste different um, aspects of it on different parts of my tongue, which, you know, I don't usually slow down when I'm eating. <laughs> you know? Right. So anyway, it was, it was wonderful. I'm going to well, do that more well, often. 
right? What I love about what you gleaned for me there in your perspective and how you felt is that when we really do slow down and we don't have that habitual push and tension to just keep doing something, um, it gives an opening for something yeah. to come in that we didn't know was there. And yeah. that's what I do with the horse. I wait for the horse and I do it with such a uh, allowing open generosity because they're training me to be that way, not because I'm generally like that, but because I've learned to become more open to them and it teaches me something about, oh, I'm thinking again instead of really being with or I'm decided that it should taste like this. And yet, if I just stop thinking and just start being, there's this whole symphony of things going on that yeah. I get to explore. And I feel really grateful for that. Thank you yeah, for sharing. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, let's, uh, uh, in the interest of time, okay. um, let's, let's take this a step further, okay? To, uh, and thank you so much, Jen. That was just You're welcome. delightful. I realized, by the way, that my choice of chocolate and its flavor is very earthy, which is the element that I chose Ooh. at the beginning. And that's part of that whole piece of feel. But anyway, so we're going to uh, uh, take this a step further and um, engage with an interaction with another uh, living being. And so we're going to do this imaginally. Um, and we're going to do this as a practice to hone the power of our imaginations. Because as many have said, it is one of the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal for um, creating something new out of um, what we have on our hands. The, uh, and in particular, the disruption in our lives now and the possibilities that these uh, disruptions um, make available to us. So we're going to imaginally practice feel in a typical situation that we have probably all encountered uh, with people who represent the other, okay? The other with a capital O. So for just for a moment, I'm gonna ask everyone to just um, get comfortable in your, where you're sitting and uh, close your eyes and take a few uh, equal breaths in and out like we practiced in our last two sessions, a count of, two, of four in and a count of four out, or whatever count is easy for you, um, so that it's an equal breath in and out. And just as you're doing that, taking an equal breath in and out, I invite you to take a moment to recall the last time you passed someone on a street corner asking for food or money from those uh, driving or walking by. Just uh, perhaps you did more than just pass that person by, but recall a recent incident as in as much detail as you are able to at this moment. Maybe it was the fellow or the woman or the family on a street corner of the grocery parking lot with a sign asking for food or money. Maybe it was a group of young people with a dog or two with a hat available for spare change. Maybe it was a musician sharing his talents. Whatever it was, just rehearse that interaction briefly in your mind. Your actions in the middle of a busy day the thoughts passing through your mind, how are fleetingly about that encounter? The questions that may have come to mind, the gestures you may have shared, whatever. Just rehearse that for a moment. Remember it. So now, in the spirit of the movie Groundhog Day, which I watched recently. Um, imagine that you are again back in that moment, passing that person. But this time, pause and allow the moment to go into slow motion as you open your senses and intuition what that person is offering you in that moment. 
just breathe into it for a moment. Breathe into this pausing as you encounter this person, this other person. Allow yourself to notice the environment surrounding you both. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you feel in your, on your skin? As you, as you take an in-breath, take a deep in-breath, listen to what your larger intuition is giving you to hear from that person. In the freedom of this imaginal world, allow yourself to ask this person or person questions. Ask them one or more questions. And then listen to acknowledge those questions, those answers to the questions. What, acknowledge what more they are telling you that is unspoken. Acknowledge the tone of their voice, their body language. Feel in your body what it means to acknowledge that person in some simple or elaborate manner. Taking another breath, allow some suggestion for a collaboration to arise between you, which you offer to one another. Imagine the listening continuing as the interaction continues. For now, just feel confidence that there is a promise of some continuing new awareness between you that will unfold in the process, similar to the way that we've been talking about the horses teaching us. For now, though, we are coming back to this present moment with one another here now. So just taking a breath and um, become present to our gathering here via Zoom and open your eyes and take a moment to jot down what new has entered into your awareness about this person that's so other to you an insight about yourself or that person or the challenges that lie before us all. Take a moment to just write a few words that have come to you. I'm feeling gratitude to the horses for showing us this power of feeling into one another. So we're gonna take a, a minute here for you to jot down some knowing, and then we'll take a moment to share.
Okay. Um, how are y'all doing? Can, would someone like to share your site? I found something really cool. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Thank good. Um, so um, it was like haltering. I would remember the imagery of what I might, when I walked by someone that had holding a sign um, and I would nod, but my body was still tight. So haltering, when I put on the halter without checking and making that tracking response to my body, I think I know what I'm doing, but I'm not feeling it. So um, what I wrote was, I walk by and nod, but my body stays coiled. I, sm I smile and still I push away. I invite with no, with no opening. But then I feel and I find all I wish for is shared space. And it was kind of like um, when I found the authentic feeling about my blueberries. Um, I could tell you I like blueberries and I could tell you that um, they were gonna taste good, but I didn't know how happy I was gonna be to take the time to really feel into that sensation and to uh, wait and pause on myself to really collect the information. Um, and when I imagined this, I collected information I didn't know was there. And so my capacity next time to really smile or wave at someone will probably be able to be more genuine. And I find that really uh, fascinating and delightful. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else. Hi, I'll share. Um... I noticed that it was really hard to keep breathing as I felt into what I perceived as this person's desperation and exhaustion with um, panhandling as a route to sustainability. He, he looked serious and sad and worn out. And I also, I, always, I do something similar, I always smile. I don't always give, um, in fact, I rarely do uh, if I see a mother with small children, I will often. Um, and it just, I just found it really hard to keep breathing through the exercise. I had to like tell myself, keep breathing, keep feeling, have an open heart to what you see there. Mm -hmm. And I think what it comes down to is that I, I feel disempowered myself to take away people's suffering. And uh, that creates an internal um, desperation of my own. Just... Mm -hmm. um, even though it was an exercise it was pretty potent I feel like I'm tearing up then yeah <sighs> yeah and sort of aligned with it thank you so much for sharing that Anjali so um, I I found myself hesitant to ask that mm. I'm having a bad connection again you can't you can't hear me now I can again okay um, I found myself hesitant to ask that person directly, uh, what can I do to help you? There was a hesitance, and, and I think it was that being disempowered that I could offer anything. Um, I don't know. It's curious for me to think about it. I, I, I really noticed that hesitance, and um, yeah. Anyone else want to share some insight that you had with this, it's pretty potent, isn't it? Okay, we're, we're running a little bit late here. We got started late, but we're, we're gonna wrap up now. And so I want us to take just a moment to reflect back over the last hour and to, um, and to open the chat function there uh, on your screens and to, if you would, to just post some word or phrase that captures um, your, what you might have discovered, what you're taking away, what you're taking away from this time. And um, so let's just take a moment to do that, to um, open the chat and, um, and post to our, the whole group. A word or phrase.
Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll have a moment to call out a single word here in just a moment, but I want to close with a poem by Anna Blake, who's become one of my favorite uh, horse people lately. And uh, I, I think this, um, she, this speaks to what we've just been exploring with feel, uh, particularly from the perspective of the horse. It's called Sage Underfoot. An elder red mare and her rider babysat us as we climbed in and out of ravines. My young horse, giddy on the trail, not running, but not walking either, crossing a small pond in leaps. Had he ever seen so much unfenced land? His body froze to the shallowest breath watching a herd of deer bound away. We came to a vast prairie, green, and the ground soft on his hooves. The mare grazed as we trotted a large arc. Afraid to look up, my eyes held to the wildflowers, Indian paintbrush and larkspur. On cue, we caught the air, the one, two, three waltz of a canter. Tense, choppy steps, my seat too loud in the saddle. My horse wanted to bolt, forcing my mind to stillness, willing my body to soften, so the gelding's neck could go long. He answered by lengthening his stride, and we found a rhythm between our bodies. The arc returned us to the beginning, lifting my eyes to patterns of color in the trees and in the sky, lost to time, just his spine rocking mine and the smell of sage crushed under hoof. So let's everyone um, share for just a moment. Uh, everyone off of mute. Can you get everyone off of mute, Denise? and share one word that we're taking home with us, taking away with us, we're probably already home, um, for this time together. Breathe. Breathe, okay. My word is feel. Stillness. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Sharon. Peace. Peace. Listening. <laughs> Peacefulness, mindfulness, exploring, sweet. Thank you all for joining us for this, our third virtual session. We'll have mm -hmm. another one in about a month, and who knows what will unfold in our times that the horses can give us their wisdom for us mm -hmm. to become fully human. <laughs> Good teachers. Yes. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Trish. Thank you, Thank you Trish. Thank you.